Hey everybody, welcome back to our neck of the woods. So in this video, we're obviously going to be drywalling the garage, but real quick, we need to start sizing out our mini split for the garage. So we're going to be looking at cooling, but also units that can heat also. So if we don't end up using the radiant floor, we will have heat in the garage until we figure out what boilers and stuff we're going to go with and trying to figure all that complex stuff out with the pumps and the expansion tanks and all that good stuff. But uh, uh, the reason why this is important, uh, calculating... Uh, a mini split or any heating and cooling device is sometimes you just can't go off of these calculators here. So for example, if we punch in uh, the garage, roughly say 36 by 26, uh, we call it an other because it's a garage, uh, I guess one person at a time. And then here, let's just say no, it's not sunny and uh, it is heavily wooded. And we see what type of calculation we have. We're only coming up with about 18,000 BTU, uh, but let's say it is extremely sunny and let's say it's no, it's not shaded at all. And again, one occupant with uh, another as a garage and we calculate that. We're only up to about 22,400. And the reason why this isn't good is because if you find a real load calculator, uh, those numbers are gonna change a lot, which is very important. So we're roughly in the middle of Ohio, so I guess anywhere from green to uh, yellow would work here. We've got 983 square feet, and let's just say we use 8 feet, for example, on the ceiling height. You can see we're only coming up with about 24,000 BTU and 24,300 for zone 4, and if we change it to zone 3, we do jump up to 25,600, but you can see the overall 24,000 stays the same. But the reason why doing this is important is because we don't have 8-foot ceilings. We've got 14-foot 3 ceilings, which jumps us all the way up to 36,000. So if we go back over to here, Again, we only had a maximum of 22,400. That's a problem when you're trying to need a unit of around 36,000. And as you can see here, load calculator goes a lot more in depth. For example, you guys all know my garage isn't standard insulation. We've got two by eight walls. We've got zip R sheathing on the outside. We're probably more in the well extreme uh, insulated, but because we have garage doors, we can't really uh, factor in how well those are going to seal around all four edges. We may have some major leaking going on. So maybe we've got more than average since the garage doors uh, aren't. Uh, it's a very large calculation of the overall square footage of the walls, but it's not um, the biggest number. So maybe we'll just keep it more than average. And sun exposure... Besides those two windows in the back, uh, or maybe early in the morning, I think we've got pretty well shaded uh, windows, I would say, maybe are average. We've only got four of them, and uh, let's see, what else? Uh, we do have well-sealed double pane, and our garage doors are going to be insulated with insulated glass. Uh, it's not a sunroom, there's no kitchen, and two or less. And you can see we dropped down to 30,000 BTU. So why is that important? Well, if you get a unit that's too small, it's gonna be running constantly. And if it's running constantly, it's not gonna be energy efficient and you're basically just gonna be burning through your electrical bill. And if you get a unit that is too big, then it can't do a proper heat cycle. So it's gonna short run, which will basically just kick on for a short amount of time, then kick back off. I believe that has to do something with the, uh, um, the heating kind of kicking in and like uh, getting the ice off the condenser and stuff like that. And obviously if it's uh, uh, short cycling, it's not going to be able to unfreeze it. And that's actually happened in our RV before. Um, we have to have our RV set at a very specific way or else uh, it can freeze up and then you're just blowing hot air because if the cooling fins are completely frozen, then air's not moving through there and you can't cool it down and make the unit work efficiently. So while 22,400 versus 36 or 30 are kind of all within a range of each other, for example, we may be going with the Mr. Cool do-it-yourself mini splits. Uh, I believe they have a 36,000 unit and a 24,000 unit. So 
If we're looking at 30, we're kind of right there in the middle. So it depends. Do you want one that's more on the 22,000 side, jumped up to 24, or the jumped up to 36? For us, it's probably pretty close. But when we start factoring in the entire house here, which is a lot more internal square footage and stuff, that's gonna be a little bit more important. But for the garage, I'm gonna to have to decide if that 24,000 is worth it or do we step up to the 36? Cause again, you're right there on the border of the two. If we go with the 30,000 calculation, depending how well insulated the garage doors end up being. But uh, don't just punch in your square footage. Uh, I tried to talk to Supply House about that and uh, basically they weren't able to help me out with that. So I was lucky enough to be able to find that load calculator online, which I think is a lot more precise, especially when you've got the garage ceiling heights at 14 foot, three inches. So we're gonna, again, figure out which one we wanna go with. Do we spend the money and go with the uh, 36 or do we go a little bit less and go with the 24? Um, I guess it just depends. Uh, you're 6,000 one way or the other or 4,000. So uh, I don't know, we'll see. But uh, I think either way, that's gonna be very efficient for the garage, that it's gonna keep the garage nice and cool throughout the year. And with, I believe, a 36,000 BTU for the heating side and like 34,000 for the cooling, if we go with the 36, I think that's a lot of BTU to throw out there in the garage. And uh, again, if we don't figure out the radiant floor system, then that thing actually should be pretty advanced and pretty efficient at actually heating our garage. So uh, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. And the other beautiful thing about the Mr. Cool is it does have a dehumidifier effect. And I know we've all been talking about this in the comments and stuff where, uh, Ventless fireplaces can make a lot of condensation and obviously cooking and showering. So since we have such a tight envelope, are we doing uh, a dehumidifier up in the attic or down in the basement to help combat all that? Or if we're not using radiant floor and we're just using the mini splits, how well are they going to be able to bring down the humidity in the house and out in the garage and keep us from mold issues and stuff? And that's a very, very awesome feature for those Mr. Cools, at least, as they're calling them their third generation uh, units. That if uh, we don't have to spend three to four thousand dollars on some massive dehumidifier, like again, up into the attic or down in the basement, and we can rely on the mini splits doing dehumidifying along with uh, heating and cooling. Uh, I think the only thing that we really need to buy then is a ERV, which I still need to research that just a little bit more. Um, for our area, we kind of get ERV or HRV uh, because we have to bring in uh, fresh air somehow with such a tight envelope. So what do you guys think? Middle of Ohio, uh, zone four, I think they're calling us. Um, should I go with an ERV or should I go with an HRV and why? I've seen again several websites throw Ohio kind of either way. Uh, I know if you're down south or up in Canada, you need to make sure you get the right one. But we're right at that level where I think it doesn't really matter if you're going HRV or ERV. But I, I think again, I'm on the ERV side. So what do you guys think for our air quality in here? Which one should we go with? Wouldn't you know it, just as I make a video saying I'm never going to Menards again, I get $1,000 in rebates today. So uh, might as well go spend the money. Um, there is a few things that we need to buy. There's some things that were out of stock and now they're back in. Uh, the first thing being, once the garage is done, I don't want to go in the garage anymore. Um, once the it's painted inside, once the garage doors are on, I would like to not go in there as often as possible to stop keep trekking mud and stuff through the garage. So I would like to start being able to use the uh, front porch here. So we'll take those uh, extra five eighths or whatever uh, sheathing that we have that I've got nailed down in some few places. We'll move them over so you've got a direct beeline into the house and we need to put some stairs on this thing. So the stringers are back in stock. They're still like a million dollars, but uh, we need to get some stringers to go down to there and then to come down to here. And how we're gonna do that is we've got one more of these treated six by six ground contacts 
we're gonna take one of the diamond pier 50 50s we're gonna put one on each end so one over here one over here we will drape that six by six laying across those and then the stringers will go from the stairs and they will sit on top of that six by six now obviously that's gonna make for a hell of a first step because you've got the tread of the first step you've got the thickness of the riser you've got the thickness of the six by six and then as you can see you've got a little bit of height there where the diamond pier 50 50 is not sitting on the ground where the bottom of that six by six will sit so that first step for a few months is going to be probably well over a foot tall but uh not a problem because once we kind of excavate this and i don't think we need to go any deeper i think this is all pretty much hard compacted clay now um, but we will be laying some limestone going out from the steps going over there and then obviously we will pour the concrete which will get us up to the appropriate code height so your first step coming off that concrete onto the first tread uh, is actually code compliant so that is something that while fred's doing the garage that we can actually do today um, we can go purchase two diamond pier 50 50s and we can go purchase our stair stringers and then with the rest of that money left over as uh i don't think we'll use that full thousand dollars on the stringers um i do want to look into some more uh garage organization number one i need like a uh like a cabinet so might as well go to menards and get the master craft cabinet that matches my toolbox and then the other thing i've already run out of space within that toolbox so I'd like to go purchase the upper toolbox, which uh, actually makes it look a lot cleaner and nicer because right now everything sitting on top of there is just kind of ugly, uh, especially all those battery chargers. So the upper toolbox has like a uh, barbecue lid that you roll up and then roll down and it's got a space bar on the inside of it so you can put all your battery chargers up on the inside plug them into the internal space bar close the lid and then from the outside the only thing that you'll have is one space bar uh, wire that leads out and goes into that four gang or that two gang uh, outlet there on the side of the wall so that'll make it look a lot cleaner will give me several more drawers to use for other tools and stuff and uh, then like my gas cans and stuff I can put them either in that tool cabinet or my uh, car washing supplies can go in the tool cabinet and that'll clean the garage up just that much more so I guess one more time than Menards, but it's not going to be the Menards Columbus East. It's going to be another one because I am not going there and dealing with them people. But uh, yeah, let's go do that real quick. And uh, maybe we even get some diamond piers set today while again, Fred is drywalling the garage. All right, looking good. Uh, I actually didn't get any of it on film because I was using the camera and uh, pulling footage for the next video and he's already done. It's only noon and I think he got started at, uh, I think he showed up about nine something, but maybe got started around 9, 30, 10. But uh, yeah, first round done. Um, I don't think, again, the first round needs to look perfect. Uh, any sagging in the tape, like I could tell there's a little bit right here. Like you got a little bit of indentation. I don't know if you guys can see that. Doesn't really matter because on the second time that you mud that'll fill in that gap there and that must have been a pretty wide crack for it to do that and then i think he said he ran out of mud his was a little bit different than my bucket he didn't use mine so we've got a little bit of the beadboard uh here to finish and going across the top but he said he'll knock that out tomorrow while uh he also again sands uh does the first layer of sanding and then whatever's not 100 percent dry um he'll have to wait on that third time like he said that he would come out but uh, he'll hit that again with uh, sanding and more mud. And like I said, looking good. Um, panel over here, uh, I'll ask him to clean this up or I don't know what I'm gonna do here, like where the drywall meets the wood. I don't know if you can put mud on there. I don't know how the wood reacts to mud as opposed to drywall. Because what actually starts drying the mud out is the drywall actually sucks the moisture out of the mud and dries it out. Wood should absorb. Um, uh, water and stuff and then uh, i told him not to worry about these because these are all going to be wood framed out so i still need to throw some drywall up in there but where i was doing this earlier this really isn't uh, a necessity to fill that crack in but uh, i'll do it anyway uh, because i told him it, it doesn't need finishing work like i can see right here in this window he didn't uh, put mud in there i can do that by myself 
because we'll flash it out with wood coming here and then I'll probably do a wood trim up and over and paint it the same color as the, um, uh, the walls or maybe make them pop a little bit different. Maybe I'll, you know, white trim and like if I did like a, a white or a gray colored wall, but make them like a little bit different, but that will, um, again, make the window pop a little bit, but he doesn't have to do those because that's all going to be covered up by wood so you won't see a thing. But uh, just for my OCD, I'll fill those cracks in. But other than that, uh, I guess we'll see you guys here tomorrow. But we're going to head downtown now, go pick up our lumber, and go pick up our diamond piers. Uh, maybe put some front uh, porch and steps on today, and then uh, we'll see what else we can do. Scratch that. He did use mine, bud. <laughs> uh, I think mine, the green top, all-purpose, and his is all-purpose lightweight. So, uh, yeah, his must sand better. I think that's what he was talking about. Um, the lightweight maybe doesn't make as much sand or is not as heavy, but uh, never mind. We're out of two buckets of mud. So two buckets of mud did this entire garage. So that's a good indication for uh, what's going to be needed for the house. So I can buy them for him or if he goes and gets it, I'll reimburse him and I'll let him use what he wants to use because he knows what works best. But uh, uh, never mind. Let's just go downtown and let's go ahead and pick up our lumber and let's put some stairs on. Okay, back home, we got our upper toolbox now. I'm happy about that. They did not have a cabinet, so I'll have to order it online or I'll probably go somewhere else and give someone else money. Um, they just won't match there. But uh, we got our stringers, we got our diamond piers. Uh, hopefully I can get the diamond piers set tonight uh, before the sun starts to go down and get the uh, uh, that six by six set in place. And then our stringers, everything doesn't have to be exact. Um, we want to try and get the 6x6 beam uh, equal to the front part of uh, this triple beam here. So at least that's straight. But as for the stringers, I mean, they can be wonky and crooked. I'll get them as straight as possible. But Aaron and I want to do kind of like a southern looking stairs. So we want 12 foot wide at the base going up to eight foot wide up there. So uh, some of these stringers are gonna have to be cut where like this one right now is kind of sitting flush up here. We're gonna have to angle cut them so it'll sit flush against here, but then we'll go down at that angle. So gotta figure out how to cut those. But something that was very interesting, uh, I didn't wanna get in trouble or yelled at by the county and went online and I was like, how far away should stringers be? What's code? Nothing really came up for code. A few things came up like uh, you should put them 12 to 16 inches apart. Okay, 12 to 16 inches apart, that's insane. No way. I'm not paying $65 a stringer to go ahead and put them 12 inches apart. Not to mention, have you guys ever seen a house where your stringers are 12 inches apart? No. You usually have three abreast that... I think a typical stairway is about three feet apart. That's nowhere near 12 inches. So why would you do that on a deck? But I called the county and they're like, we have absolutely no code for it. And I'm like, okay, you, you've got every other code for hand railing and how you cut those out and stuff, but you really don't have anything for the width. And that really shocked me. Um, my father-in-law's house uh, that was built uh, in a county and in a city where they actually have no building code. Uh, the guy who built that house could do whatever he wanted and there was no one to question him. Uh, the only thing that about his stairs is I believe he's got about eight foot wide stairs and he's only got three stringers. So if you subtract the uh, stringer thickness at an inch and a half, you're really looking at about 45 inches uh, where it's not supported. Has that stair fallen apart? No, it's a two by 12 tread. So it's obviously uh, not breaking or falling apart. It's got a little bit of movement in it when you walk up them, but uh, I'm trying to shoot for somewhere around two feet apart. Unfortunately, that's all the stringers that were available. And uh, like I said before, I'm not going to another store and I'm not going to the one that I usually go to. So. I was only able to purchase five. So at the bottom, the absolute biggest distance going to be is uh, about 34 inches, but then it's gonna get a hell of a lot closer together once we get up here at that eight foot for five of them. So it's the 12 foot for only five where there's a little bit of uh, a difference. But again, I think a two by 12 
inch and a half tread is not really going to flex at 34 inches. In fact, I don't even know what the stairs are going up into the house from the garage or going down into the basement. Those could be 30 inches or more, but again, those are nowhere near 12. So I don't know who talks people into doing stuff like that, but that's ridiculous. So I'm going to get this first one set. It will have to be cut, as you can see. Uh, the closest that I could get to number wise was 10 steps and I'm going to say at least two of those steps are going to have to be cut off uh, or I mean, I, ho I hope I don't have to do more than that because again, it's all going to depend how thick the diamond pier is how thick the six by six is, and then the stair sits on top of there. So I'm at least gonna set the first one from the um, uh, equal with the top here like it is now, because again, as we put our treads on here or whatever we're gonna do for decking, that is gonna be a smooth transition. This is actually gonna be the first deck or set of stairs where you don't have to step up onto the deck. This one, I'm just gonna go ahead and make it flush like that. And then we'll continue uh, the decking from here over to the first uh, step, if you will, even though it's not a step, it's already deck level. But I'll go ahead and set that one, get it set, and then we'll figure out just how much cutting we have to do uh, down there on the ground. Okay, so I just used this stringer here to get my diagonal, which if you're not familiar with that, I've got a nail down here coming off the outside of this post out eight feet. And then up here, I've got my level sitting perfectly level, both this way and this way. That nail's kind of holding it in place so it doesn't fall. But put my uh, tape measure down over there, measured to the back side of the level and uh, I came over from a mark up there six feet. So when you've got six feet going this way and eight feet going that way, you've got A squared plus B squared equals C squared, which should be exactly 10 feet. And right now we are dead on. So right here, I know that I can put a mark on the ground. That's gonna be the center of that diamond pier. But now I just need to figure out where I'm gonna put the diamond pier front to back. But I know the center of that diamond pier going this way will be right where uh, this board is in line. Okay. <laughs> so that pier is set where I want it, front to back, left to right. Now that six by six, I cut down the 12 feet. Uh, the, Alan, the engineer and I have the setting at the uh, one foot mark and the 10 foot mark. So that six by six is gonna have a one foot cantilever over on this side and over on that side. So you'll have a six by six going 10 feet unsupported, which again, doesn't really matter because it's only holding up the bottom of the stringers. Even if there is a little bit of flex at 10 feet, which Alan says there shouldn't be. Um, that's why he said it at that cantilever uh, area there. We should be okay. So the only difficult part now is usually when you set diamond piers, you can set them on completely uneven ground because you're setting them on individual posts. So when you have a laser level and you're measuring like that three ply beam up there, each one of the six by sixes is what you're setting to your height. But because we're taking a six by six and not running it vertically, we're running it horizontally, we have to get that dead flat. So the ground again is already uneven. That one sits a little bit lower than where this one is. So I may have to over dig on this one to get it down into the ground more, but we can set the six by six on that one now, run it this way and just see how much I need to do. If it's not a hundred percent level, since this isn't structural having to worry about like wind uplift like the roof and the deck really uh, i'm pretty confident that i could throw some shims on that side and get that six by six up level because all it's doing is pushing down on the shims again we're not losing bracket force uh, for uplift on a set of stairs they're not going to go anywhere so again if i do have to shim that side so be it i will shim that side but uh, I'm gonna get that 12 footer over here now, lay it across, see how high off the ground we are. And I roughly know uh, from the top of the diamond pier down to the soil, that's about four and a half inches. 
So we may have to dig this one down another two or three inches, which probably won't hurt it. It won't be at the top of the girdle or the bottom of the girdle where it normally goes, but uh, I, I think it will be fine. Let me catch my breath here. We'll move that over and then we'll see how much we got to do. Okay, so for this one, pretty simple. I measured my one foot in from there to the center there, which once I have that foot there, I obviously have my one foot in over here, which gives me my center line right there. So that's easy enough. And then as for the distance off to here, obviously just measuring from there to there and then measuring from there to there gave me my horizontal line right there. So X marks the spot. We'll set one more pier right there and then uh, I am one inch high over here, so it's actually not that bad. Uh, so I'll have pretty much one inch of the girdle now covered, and hopefully we don't have to shim. Uh, maybe if we want to make it perfect, but uh, that should be super, super easy. That couldn't have gone any better. We are completely level this way. And with a little bit of adjustment uh, from the bolt hole and that mounting plate sitting on the diamond pier, we are 100% equal off of the deck, both this way and this way. So I'm gonna pound those pins in and then stay tuned. Aaron and I got a surprise for you. Okay, <laughs> all finished. Guys, diamond pier, <clears throat> seriously, how can you not? Look at the excavation dirt there is. Literally nothing that I just pushed around with my feet. You can tell obviously what I excavated because it's dark uh, versus this light clay stuff. Yes, with a sledgehammer, it takes a little bit of work, but honestly, if that was a hole with concrete, I'd be spending that much time and that much energy bringing concrete bags, bags over here, cutting them open, picking them up one at a time, putting them into a mixer, mixing them up, either pouring that directly in the hole or transferring it with a five gallon bucket and doing that 20, 50 times I mean, seriously, again, how, how can anyone not be using these things? And the fact that they can get big enough, like structural, like the 75s we got over here, and I think they even go up to 100, and they'll even sell you up to 200s if uh, your engineer and stuff call for it. But you need a soil analysis done on that before you can purchase the big boys. But, uh, I mean, there's no skid steer, there's no auger, there's no excavation work, there's no concrete, there's no rebar. You're just done. And uh, I do want to say thank you to Diamond Pier. They actually found us uh, a video, uh, probably one that I tagged or hashtagged. And uh, they wanted to say thank you for representing them. Uh, I'm not sponsored by them or anything, but they uh, did send out a care package to us. They gave me a, a t-shirt, a pretty large, like 16 ounce uh, coffee mug, some fish lures, some carpenter pencils, um, I think another like drinking cup, a bottle opener, some brochures, and just a whole little, like I said, care package for us, uh, just for using them and talking about them on YouTube right now. So again, Diamond Pier, thank you. And uh, if you do want to sponsor us, we are available. I still need to buy about 15 or more for the backyard and for the back deck. But uh, for right now, for what I got set, oh, this thing is just absolutely a dream. So easy to use. So uh, as soon as Aaron gets ready, she just got home from work. We're going to bust out and show you this guy's surprise. Okay, now I'm done. Now for the surprise. The only other thing I will have to do to those, by the way, because I am using a sledgehammer, I mushroom the top of those poles out a little bit. So I'll have to get my hand grinder and just go around them to uh, take out that mushroom lip so I can put the cap on. But uh, that's still easier than concrete and rebar. You ready? Sure. Okay, I'm sure you guys have seen the other ones laying around, but uh, the first time one that we bought was their top of the line uh, shingle. Uh, it was aluminum. We did not like the look because it's made by Classic and they called it a Classic Shake. So it basically looks like a shingle shake, a wood shake. They also have like cedar looking shakes, but it was aluminum 
Again, it says that it was our top of the line, but I hit it like this with my knuckle and dented it. So I'm like, there's no way, I don't want this. Um, and then they made you put a foam panel underneath of it because again, I think it's so weak, it sags. Uh, so I'm like, what, do you have anything better? And the Kessel line, the Kessel shake and the Kessel something else, um, they come in steel, galvanized, and like a 26 gauge. I hit it with my full fist and could not dent it. So definitely the way to go over what they say is more expensive and better. But uh, we then got three samples of color, and I think this is our fourth one. Um, hopefully it's what we want. We've been getting more on the black side than their uh, graphite, which is more gray, obviously. Uh, so instead of having like gray with black flake, we wanted more black with silver flake, and that's what we got. So, let's see what it looks like. Well, it's not black black. Hold on. What? I want to get the old ones to compare it. I don't know. I think you guys can see that in 4K. The uh, slight bit of gray flake in it. I think up on a roof, you'll never be able to see it. But uh, the older one, which is more graphite with gray, uh, gray or black, uh, that I think you could see a little bit easier from the roof. But uh, there's not too much of a difference. That, I mean, there's definitely more black flake in it, but not to mention this one's now dirty. So. I don't know if you guys can even see it. It shows up on camera that that's a lot more gray than that. But uh, that's the aluminum. That's just a uh, shiny black. This is a, I think just black black. Yeah. Again, hard to tell because it's so dirty. Next to those. But. Because I wanted something that was in between that and that. On camera you get it, in person, they're a little bit closer, but it's not bad. It's good. Now, these colors, you probably can't tell on camera, but that old one over there, that shiny black, that's basically just a powder coat. I think they've got like a 20 or 30 year on it, but these three here, basically on top of their powder coat, they powder coat it more, and there's so much buildup on that panel it's very rough and uh, it doesn't give off that shininess, which if I clean this one up, I'm sure you can tell. It's extremely smooth, extremely shiny. These are very rough like sandpaper. So not only will that be easier to walk on and not slip and break your neck, but uh, with that Thermabond coating on it, um, they say that they jump up their uh, paint warranty to 120 years. So don't know if the company will still be around to warranty that, but uh, that is very, very thick and a lot more than what's on the regular stuff. So even though that is steel and not their top of the line aluminum, you still got a galvanized panel. Then you're building up multiple layers of powder coat and paint and everything like that. And honestly, I think that's gonna outlast Aaron and I. So that's what we're going with. We were gonna go with stand and seam metal roofs, but we decided against it because since we're doing uh oh wait have we told them what siding we're doing yet i don't think we have no. should we i think maybe you have you said it was a lot of vertical lines so they probably know or you said it's board and batten well well there you go since we're doing board and batten either with lp smart siding or like a james hardy or fiber cement we didn't want vertical lines on the siding and then vertical lines on the roof so with these, it's gonna look more like a shingle, but again, it's metal, it lasts forever. Because there's an air gap under these, we do not have to put any foam backing because the steel is stronger. Uh, it's already got a massive air channel underneath of it from how high it sticks up off the ground. I think they say these things are about an inch or so uh, overall. So no air gap is needed. Um, Again, that's going to really break up the roof and the siding line, uh, sight line, that it's not going to be all just vertical seams. And again, I like it that it's kind of roughed up, looking like a, a wood Kessel shake, they call it, even though it still looks like a, a cedar shake. But uh, there it is. We're going to email them and say we like it, order them, 
let's go ahead and get them. And it looks like there's gonna be about a two to three week lead time. And then unfortunately, hopefully, hopefully sooner, but I'll be probably roofing in the middle of July. So that sounds awesome. Okay, first stringer done. The only thing that really sucks is, you can see I had to cut a big piece off of there. Uh, I knew I needed somewhere around eight and a half or so on a stringer. Didn't feel like cutting my own this time, like in the basement or uh, out in the garage, I used uh, the ones that were already pre-cut too. But uh, I needed like eight and a half or something stringers and uh, they didn't make a nine. So I had to cut that off, which I'm sure that's like $20 or so per stringer. But I just got it cut to where it's sitting. I, actually, I couldn't have planned that better myself. Uh, the front of that stair is now completely flush with the front of the uh, 6x6 here. And um, uh, when you put a piece of inch and a half up there, so from the ground, from the height of the stair, plus the height of the tread, we're 22 and a half inches off the ground right now. So we're definitely going to have to figure out um, how much stone we'll have to bring in here. And then the thickness of the concrete slab will probably be almost equal to the front of that uh, six by six, unless we do a concrete step up uh, and make the concrete slab lower um, for the actual sidewalk. But uh, we'll figure that out at a later date. But at least first one's done. I'm going to take that one back off, measure it to all the other ones, and then we'll go from there. Before the sun goes down completely, uh, they are fanned out. They're 12 foot uh up to eight foot but anyone want to catch my mistake or tell me how i'm going to fix this and make it look good so this first one here completely flush but i do have to cut these nubs off i was saving them just to see how it would look but as we fan out more and more we're losing more and more deck space that these are sitting on not to mention um i don't know how we're actually going to trim these out uh, I can't imagine cutting these straight so they're straight with that. But even then, it wouldn't be f uh, straight because that's so much further out this way. It's not uh, set back as far as it is. I mean, that's set back there uh, over halfway. Um, if we use composite, that would probably be pretty easy. For example, for example, the kicker could probably swing out here and arc, and I would be able to bend that and uh, face nail it or face screw it in each and every one of these going up. But what about going this way? You're not gonna, you can bend a piece of lumber this way, but a flat piece of lumber sitting here, you're not gonna be able to bend it that way. So I don't know how I'm gonna get that to arc up and around. Um, if I cut slits in it, uh, those slits are just going to rot and expose and show, not to mention it's going to weaken it because, like we said, right about here, we're probably 35 inches, tapering up to two feet, and doesn't matter, even if I added 100 more stringers, um, not exactly sure how we're going to get those treads on or the kickers if we do use them. And then, again, with the 6x6 uh, six six here exposed, um, I don't know. We could probably hide the 6x6 six by, six by pouring the concrete high enough and uh, having the concrete go up and over the 6x6, six six, but uh, uh, brainstorm it out. Let me, let me know what you guys think. How, how, how do you finish out curved steps? Or uh, I'll research it with you guys and see how you actually finish these out and make them look pretty. All right, everybody, I think I figured it out last night. Aaron found some articles and some YouTube videos how to fix the stairs, and basically I was doing it wrong. So you don't taper each individual step. You leave them all completely straight, and you only taper the outside ones. Now, what makes me feel really good about that is now instead of going out to like 34 inches, each one of these is only going to be 24 inches on center so only 22 and a half inches unsupported and for a 2 by 12 that is more than enough um, the outside ones though we're gonna have to custom make out of a 2 by 12 piece of lumber so we'll go ahead and attach that as close to up here as possible and then those are the ones that are going to taper down to the outside down here on the 6 by 6 so what is awesome about that is 
uh, you're still on a two foot layout down here. And then of course you're tapering up to the top there. So as you get up through here, it's only gonna get stronger because you're coming closer and closer on that uh, uh, less than uh, two foot overhang or a gap there unsupported. So we can actually just cut these nubs off real quick, attach all five of these, uh, start laying some, and then at a later time, we'll go ahead and purchase those two by 12s, and then we'll go ahead and make the outside ones. Um, hopefully I don't mess that up because it's gonna be, each one's gonna have to be cut individually so that it's straight and the stairs and everything and the, uh, the kick plates all come in line, but uh, that'll be something that uh, I'll just have to practice on and try to get done. But uh, at least for right now, that makes me feel good that uh, I'm, I, there's nothing that I have to change or fix. Just uh, move them over. We'll go ahead and nail them down now and then we're good. And then actually I forgot, we do have some two by tens here in eight foot that we'll go ahead and throw those on and then we'll have some uh, construction stairs for now and then as in that last video I just posted uh, somebody from the Netherlands just commented and said where he lives they actually do make different outlets so went down in the basement and I forgot that the outlets down there the two GC GCFIs they are different um, one of the ones I actually stole from the outside panel uh, where uh, it couldn't be in there anymore because our wires are so big they were running up and the outlet stuck too far inside we had to go ahead and remove that but that GCFI was a weather resistant GCFI and the one uh, the other one in there is a normal inside house one so it's the inside house one that was tripping on the paint sprayer so not exactly sure why that is um, when I painted the basement, I was using a 100 foot uh, 10 gauge and a 100 foot 12 gauge and the pump was not tripping and it was connected to the RV and that RV outlet is GCFI protected on the inside to the bathroom and it's only hooked up to a 15 amp breaker and there was no issue. Here, we're tripping a breaker or a, a GCFI outlet that was hooked up to a 20 amp breaker, only using a 100 foot uh, 10 gauge cord. And for whatever reason, that GCFI was not getting along with that pump, but the weather resistant GCFI was not tripping. So there must be a different, like the gentleman from the Netherlands was saying, is the weather resistant may have a different load on it because it's subject to see possibly more water or uh, moisture in the air. So it must not be as sensitive or something, but uh, that must have been the reason. All right, Fred's finished up for day two. Looks like he just furthered, uh, feathered everything out a little bit more. So tomorrow should be in store for the first bit of sanding. Um, apparently he just does more than one layer because I don't think he did any sanding today. There's nothing on the ground. I didn't see him clean up, but uh, we're getting there. That's one more feathered out. So hopefully tomorrow uh, he'll finish up on this side, uh, finish up up along here. And uh, yeah, we're looking really good. So far, so good. I'm happy. And then as for me finishing up today, I'm going to go into work tonight, but uh, went ahead and set them all, all the stairs that they're two foot on center. Went ahead and grabbed these two by tens again. I'll tell you what, these things are getting a workout. I bought these things like two years ago. They were sitting in storage. They were used as our uh, concrete footers, uh, forms, uh, planks for the ICF uh, bracing. Now they're being used as stairs on the garage and the front porch and on the inside. But at least for now, we've got kind of direct access into the house. So uh, maybe in a hundred years when our front door shows up, we can start using this as an entrance and uh, coming up this way and bringing everything into the house because not only do we have a much bigger door than the garage, we don't have to do that turn. And then again, once we get the garage uh, finalized, painted and finished, um, I'll probably end up doing the real stairs and everything in there. So I want the stairs and the landing and the, the railings, everything to look nice and pretty and uh, clean it up and finish it. And then I don't want to be walking in constantly muddy boots if you're out here and having to go inside to get stuff. Uh, I don't want to be trekking that stuff all over our new stairs and creating scratches and dings and stuff. So we'll use their front door once that's done. But uh, so far looking good. Like I said, I'm going to go into work tonight. So we'll wrap this video up here probably tomorrow or the next day when Fred finishes up on the drywall and uh, we'll, we'll see how it looks. So I'll see you guys back then.
Hey everybody, welcome back. It's uh, day three, uh, Friday, or it used to be. It's now really early Saturday morning. Uh, I just got off work for two days in a row. Um, but it was uh, Fred's third time out here. So he said he pretty much got three layers on everything. And you can definitely see he's really fanned out now on that mud and stuff. So uh, definitely looks like We'll have a nice clean finish. Um, I did catch him today when I woke up. He actually was out here uh, working. Didn't even know he was here uh, right when I was kind of getting ready for work. And uh, he said he finished up. He'll be back on Monday morning. And um, he pretty much just does three layers and then sand. So he's like, sanding's bad enough, which I think we can all agree. So uh, he'll pretty much just do one time sanding. And uh, I guess uh, since it's Saturday now, if I see any cracks develop on uh, today when I wake up or tomorrow on Sunday, then I'll just go ahead and uh, fill them in. So that way on Monday he can uh, get a nice sand for everything. But uh, it, it looks good. Um, I don't really see much. Uh, oh, there's a little bit right here. So. A little bit of a pitting right there, I guess, and a, maybe a screw right there. And there's a crack right there for a screw. So I'll give that a little bit of a sand tomorrow morning or t today when I wake up and then uh, sand it down for him. And then that way when he again sands that wall on Monday, it'll look perfect. So, but it looks like a good job. Probably a, a, a definitely 600 bucks well worth it and uh, I'm happy with it, but I wanna get this video out to you guys, so I'm gonna wrap it up here, and uh, I guess on the next video, we'll start with the sanding and picking a paint color, and I do have to do the trim down here along the uh, base everywhere, and for those, I actually did end up spending the money and getting, um, PVC trim. So that's what these long white boards are here. You can put them wood grain out or flip them over and they'll be smooth side, but it doesn't really matter. But uh, they are PVC. So uh, whatever paint that we pick down along here, or maybe the whole garage, depending how much more expensive it is, but uh, definitely like the paint down here, I'll probably end up picking like an exterior paint or a bathroom paint, something that when I'm washing the car, I'm not gonna hurt the paint. And as I'm like washing off the floor or mopping the floor, since I bought that mop and bucket, um, that's why I wanted the PVC trim. So there will be absolutely nothing to rot, nothing to mold, and uh, that trim will protect uh, the drywall down along the bottom again from rotting or uh, getting mold on it too. So again, I'm going to wrap this video up here. Uh, we'll start the next video finishing out and sanding. And uh, until then, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Again, it feels nice to get the stairs up into the house, getting the garage that much closer to being done in my dream garage. Uh, please like and subscribe as always. Comment as you guys always do. You guys are doing awesome. Makes us feel good with all your good suggestions and stuff and keeping that motivation for me going to getting this done. Uh, hit us up on Instagram neck of the woods 2020 if you need to message us or show us any pictures of your project so we can share stuff back and forth a little bit easier and uh we'll see you guys then so until then take care